Okay, sorry to keep all of you waiting. Um, this is supposed to be a doorstop originally, but I think to uphold social distancing, we are doing it in this format. Okay, we can begin. Huh? Um, we've been tracking the situation globally very closely, as all of you are aware, and the numbers are continuing to rise very rapidly. Outside of China, the number of cases is doubling every five to seven days. And so we in Singapore are also seeing more imported cases in these recent days. We have seen around 20 in the last four days, and many of them are returning residents, Singaporeans, PRs, or long-term pass holders who were overseas and came back to Singapore. And that's why today, with immediate effect, we are putting out an advisory uh, to, for all Singaporeans to defer non-essential travel, travel ab abroad uh, to all countries. Right? So that's an immediate advisory going out today for all Singaporeans to defer all non-essential travel abroad. Uh, besides those returning from overseas, we've also had a number of cases from ASEAN countries, from our neighbours, uh, including a few that came with the very specific purpose of seeking medical care here. And it is really hard for us to cope with this additional demand uh, during this critical period when our healthcare resources are already stretched. And that's why, for both reasons, um, firstly on the number of, to manage the number of imported cases and also to deal with this um, demand for healthcare services, uh, we have to be tighter on our border control measures. And so from 16 of March 2359, the task force has decided to put in place a new stay-at-home requirement for all travellers coming back from UK, Switzerland, Japan and ASEAN countries. In other words, anyone with recent travel history in these countries will have to effectively self-quarantine for 14 days at their place of residence. It could be their home or it could be a hotel and they have to stay there for a full 14 days. For nationals of ASEAN countries, we will have an additional requirement, which is that they will have to submit health information to our overseas missions, and this will have to be approved by the Ministry of Health before they travel. So that's an additional requirement we put in place for nationals of all ASEAN countries. And this requirement will also take effect at the same time as the new 14-day stay-home requirement. We are putting these arrangements in place for the whole of ASEAN, but we do have to um, put in place some special considerations for Malaysia because of the close proximity and the high interdependency between our two countries. So for now, the arrangements which I've just described will not apply to our sea and land crossings with Malaysia. Right? So all the arrangements that I've described that's in the press statement today will not apply to our sea and land crossings with Malaysia. We do need precautions to be taken at these checkpoints, but it is going to be more complex given the high volume of people moving in and out of these checkpoints. On our land crossing alone, 300,000 people move across the checkpoint every day. So it is um, more complex. We want precautions to be taken there. And so separate arrangements are being worked out through the bilateral joint working group we have with Malaysia. They are, they are already in discussion and they will work through separate measures. The other existing travel restrictions we have put in place specifically to um, ban all short-term visitors from entering Singapore or transiting through Singapore, we have applied that to a few countries. Those existing travel restrictions remain. So, if you look at our travel restrictions and border control, 
effectively, we now have a three-tier framework for travellers from countries of highest risk. Uh, they will not be allowed entry or transit through Singapore. This is for the short-term uh, visitors. And this would apply to China, France, Germany, Italy, Iran, Republic of Korea and Spain. Residents and long-term pass holders coming back will be allowed to. For those from Hubei, they will have to serve a 14-day quarantine. The others will have to serve a 14-day stay-at-home notice. And then short-term visitors are not allowed entry or transit. That remains. Today, we are introducing a second tier for countries which are at risk, but we do not think it is necessary to disallow visitors from coming but we require all of them from these new countries, Japan, Switzerland, UK and ASEAN countries to serve a full 14-day stay-at-home notice when they arrive. And then for those coming with um, the nationals from ASEAN countries, we also require them to submit their health information to our overseas mission as an additional requirement. So that's our second tier. And then, of course, the third tier would be countries that can come without any travel restrictions. And with a more tiered risk-based framework, uh, that will allow us more flexibility to manage uh, the flows of people coming through our borders. And we can adjust according to the risk situation. Right? Some countries may be uh, we, 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 some countries may have no restrictions today, we may have to move them up to the middle tier or even to the top tier later on. Some countries that are in the top tier today, as some of you have asked, if the situation stabilises, we may very well move them later on to the middle tier or maybe to the lowest tier. And so we can escalate or de-escalate depending on our assessment of risk and that will be based on the data and evidence. But this gives us a more comprehensive and rigorous framework in place to ensure that our border controls remain tight and to allow us to limit the number of uh, imported cases coming into Singapore. Right, so I will stop here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions from you. Uh, this is Ameya from Bloomberg News here. Uh, so partly you answered the question about Malaysia. Uh, just wanted if uh, what kind of arrangements are the governments working on? That is one question. And the second one is about this religious gathering thing in Malaysia. Uh, I just went through the story. The numbers are very huge. 16,000 um, among them, 14,500 Malaysians, and only 4,000 or 5,000 identified. How are you tackling with this issue? I mean, with the kind of movement given between the two nations? Sorry, with the? The, uh, the religious gathering event at Malaysia is, it has a potential of blowing out to be a big uh, this thing because of the 15,000 people at attending there, only 5,000 have been Id identified. And you mentioned the movement between the two nations, 300,000 odd people. What is Singapore doing uh, to avoid that kind of a thing? All right, sure, thank you. Um, so on the first question, what sort of arrangements, they, they are still discussing, so I wouldn't want to preempt what um, additional precautions that have to be taken, but it is very complex, as I mentioned, because of the high, large volumes of people moving to and fro the land checkpoints. And these would include Malaysians who come here to work daily, commute. It also includes Singaporeans who commute to and fro um, on a daily basis. And if you were to impose a 14-day requirement, then I think it will be very difficult and very, very disruptive for both our countries. So clearly, for such travellers and day, day commuters, a 14-day requirement will not um, be able to, will not be practical or feasible. And we will need to think about other precautions, um, checking their health, for example, in a more rigorous way on both sides, and then seeing what uh, we can do, say, for workers who come into Singapore and making sure that when they are in Singapore working, um, they also take precautions in their workplaces. So discussions are ongoing between the two sides, and hopefully we can make progress on these. 
on the large-scale gatherings. Actually, it's not just in Malaysia. For the one in Malaysia, uh, we are already following up on those who had attended, and then we will make sure that the close contacts of the confirmed cases are identified and quarantined, which we are already doing. But really, it goes beyond one event, because there, are, there continue to be events around us, large-scale gatherings. And so I would, I would uh, advise all Singaporeans attending any large-scale gathering. It could be a religious gathering, it could be a concert, it could be a social gathering, but if you are attending a large-scale gathering or if you are traveling overseas, first of all, with the latest advisory, we are really asking everyone defer all non-essential travel anywhere in the world. Secondly, if somebody is going to travel, please avoid some of these uh, large-scale events because there is a risk. And if many Singaporeans go there and then come back, uh, there is a real risk that this could be a super spreader event and then the numbers would, uh, coming back would create a sudden surge of infected cases within Singapore. So I would just um, ask Singaporeans to uh, exercise caution, avoid non-essential travel as far as possible and even if they have to travel overseas in our regional countries, then take extra precautions. Hi, uh, Minister. I come from the CCTV. Uh, I have the one question. It's because now the, in China, we, we found the confirmed case is dropping down. And do you think it's uh, possible to remove China, the mainland China, from the border re restriction list? Thank you. Well, so as I mentioned earlier, with this new category of um, travel restriction, it is not an outright ban on short-term visitors, which was the earlier category we had put in place where we disallowed any short-term visitors. With this category, we are allowing visitors subject to a 14-day self-isolation requirement or a self-quarantine requirement. So, as I said, men I mentioned just now, now that we have a new category in place, potentially countries that are in that original category where we disallowed visitors. If the situation in, that in any country, it could be China, it could be Korea at some point in time, if we assess the risk situation to be lower and the, um, the infection, um, the viral virus outbreak there to be well contained, then we may well adjust and bring some of these countries down to the second category, for example. Right? And then, of course, over time, if there are countries in the second category that are also um, uh, where if the, uh, after a period of time we see some of these countries uh, stabilizing the, the situation being very well contained, then they may even come down to the third category. The point is now we have a more calibrated system. It's not just outright disallow or free for all. There's something in between, which is that you can come, but your uh, visitors will have to serve a 14-day stay-at-home notice. Uh, so I think that allows us more flexibility and more uh, tools in order to manage uh, arrivals from any country in the world. Hi, Eva from China 8 News. 不好意思,可以请部长用中文讲一下为什么有必要提升这个旅行的一个限制。We do Mandarin later. Let's uh, okay. focus on English. Yeah. Hi, this is Li Ying from CNA. I just wanted to clarify that um, Malaysians arriving via air will have to submit the health information to... Uh, uh, to the overseas mission as well. That's right. right. Okay, That's sure. right. Okay. Um, can you also um, let us know what's the expected volume of applications from the ASEAN nations and you know how long is the approval process and whether there's any penalty for you know their false declarations? Penalties for false declarations, okay. Um, how, how long will the process take? How many people will apply? I really don't know, right? I mean, the, 
we are putting in a new requirement and I'm sure travellers will adjust to the new requirement. We'll have to see uh, how they adjust, so it depends on what happens uh, in the coming days. And then if there is um, still a lot of applications, I'm sure our missions will do, our, do their best to process all of them and then we will you know, try to work through the process um, as smoothly as possible. But the key is that there will be a requirement now to institute this new health um, um, certification, if you will. Huh? They will have to apply to the overseas mission for, uh, to submit information on their health. We would want them, for example, to also indicate where will they be staying in Singapore right, for the full 14 days. And so all that information will have to be submitted. It will be subject to approval and then they can uh, travel. So we are putting out this requirement and travellers from ASEAN countries who, are, who would like to travel to Singapore will now have to take all this into consideration before they make their travel plans. Uh, Minister Kenneth from today here. You talked about um, foreigners coming to Singapore to seek treatment. Um, how, how is the government dealing with these, these cases? That's my first question. Um, my second question is, the new restrictions announced today will effectively grind tourism to a stop. Could you comment on the impact uh, of these new measures on tourism-related businesses? Thanks. What's our, how do we address the issue of um, visitors coming here to seek medical treatment? This is indeed a response, right? That now we are saying, before you come, you have to submit information about your health. And we may, depending on your health status, reject and disallow you from coming. Because our priority during this period of time has to be to ensure that our healthcare resources are focused on helping Singaporeans. And if there are Singaporeans who are sick, there are Singaporeans who are infected, we have to ensure that we have adequate ICU and healthcare capacity to take care of them. So because this is a priority, we now have this new requirement uh, for all ASEAN visitors coming to Singapore to seek uh, medical treatment. The, on the second point, will this impact tourism? Yes, but the answer is tourism has already been impacted in a very significant way, even before any of these measures. The fact that the virus is now a global pandemic, the fact that countries everywhere are putting in place additional travel restrictions and more and more countries are starting to put in quite stringent measures, I think very few people are travelling anyway. So travel has been and will continue to be impacted and if the virus goes on for a few more months, the impact is going to be severe. And that's why the government has said uh, we are looking at the second package. We already rolled out the first package in the budget with additional help given for the uh, most impacted industries, which includes aviation, tourism, uh, accommodation, hotels. So we are very mindful of the impact and we are now in the process of working out a second package. It's indeed a response to those who come here to seek medical treatment and they have to submit information, for example, on their health. So are you saying that um, based on that you would reject those applications and they, they won't be able to enter Singapore? So it, it will depend on their health status. Okay. Uh, so if there, is in, there are indeed cases of uh, uh, depending on their health information that they submit, we may very well uh, reject the application um, before they arrive here. Right? Because the main objective besides reducing the number of infected cases, we also do not want a surge in numbers of people coming into Singapore who may well be symptomatic um, and then coming here to be tested and to be treated here. 
we understand why they would like to do so and we would certainly like to help them. But if there is a sudden surge, we don't have the capacity to do so. And the capacity of our healthcare system must, must be prioritised for Singaporeans. So that is the reason why we now have this additional requirement in place. Thank you, Minister Aradna from Reuters. I uh, just wanted to confirm, check with you, when was the, is this the first time Singapore has ever issued sort of a blanket advisory to avoid all non-essential travel overseas? First question. Second question, you mentioned the people who are coming to Singapore to uh, seek treatment. Possible to give any clarity on from where they came or the case numbers? Um, and third one is obviously uh, the elections have been a hot topic. Uh, the opposition parties are urging the government not to hold elections during uh, the outbreak. Just wondered if there's sort of a risk assessment that the government is doing uh, about holding an election during, potentially during the outbreak. What was the first question again? Uh, is this the first time ah, Singapore? first time. Yes. I don't, I, I, I don't know if it's the first time. I would imagine so because I, I don't know of any other time where we have dealt with a virus of this nature that is everywhere in the world and it's um, the scale, the magnitude and the severity. So I would imagine so, but we can go back and double check uh, the facts. Um, second question on... Um, to, ah, which are the cases? Um, I don't have the exact case number, but if you look at the daily reports that we put out, you would find that there are cases who are literally arri on arrival, sent straight to hospital. Those are the ones who already knew they were symptomatic. And they are not coming on private jets, they're coming through commercial airlines. They, uh, the airlines obviously deem them fit to travel, so even if you were to ask the airlines to check, somehow, you know, the airlines will not reject everyone, so they are deemed fit to travel and they come to Singapore and when they arrive, there are some who literally are sent straight away to NCID and to the hospital for treatment. Uh, and the, the facts are in the, the, which case number, which are the, um, the, the information on the cases, you can see from the previous daily reports. So we've had some of these cases. Um, we are concerned that the numbers may go up. And while we understand, like I said earlier, while we understand why um, people would want to come to Singapore for treatment, and we would welcome them in any other circumstances, but given the nature of uh, the situation today and how pressing it is and how uh, the numbers are growing everywhere in the world, uh, we do think this additional precaution that we have just put in place is necessary. On the elections, that's not a question I can answer because, frankly, I don't think or worry about it. My sole pre preoccupation is tackling the virus. We don't hold back on what is necessary to protect Singaporeans. So advisories on gatherings, we put it out. Right? Uh, we are not saying, so we have put out strict advisories on social distancing, on gatherings. Anything and everything that we think is necessary, be it um, in terms of travel restrictions or things we have to do within Singapore. Uh, that's the task force priority. Within that context, whether an election should be held and if so, would adjustments be made to the way, the conduct of the elections, I think that's something that other parties will have to worry about. Specifically, if the Prime Minister went to call elections, uh, he will have to think about that. And if he decides to do so, he has laid out his considerations very clearly just yesterday. And then if, they, if the Prime Minister decides, and uh, given the um, prevailing guidance and advisories on events, gatherings, social distancing, then... I'm sure um, organizers will have to make adjustments accordingly. We'll take the last question. Um, hi, Hia from Zapao here. So the first question, um, there's new uh, restric travel restrictions for countries like Japan and Switzerland. Why not for US when US cases are much higher than these countries? Second question is, um, 
there has been a double-digit increase in terms of new cases the past few days. So what is our current estimate of when the peak will appear? And third question, also regarding the G. So you mentioned that you know, uh, the task force will do all out uh, to protect Singaporeans. Uh, so what are some possible measures that we put in place during election period of time so that, um, to prevent a uh, virus from spreading? Mm. Yeah. Um, the first question, we are watching America quite closely. Yes, you are right that the numbers are rising there as well. But if you look at the countries that we have highlighted, um, one concern we have in UK, in Switzerland, in Japan, it's not just that the numbers, it's not just about the numbers that they have reported. In the case of the UK, it is rising very rapidly, but it's not just about the numbers, but the fact that these countries have abandoned any attempt at containing the spread of the virus. They have said so publicly, especially the UK and Switzerland, perhaps less so for Japan. But certainly in the case of UK and Switzerland, they have, um, I think the UK has been most public in, in acknowledging that there's no point containing and they are simply now at the phase of trying to delay the spread. Uh, so if there is no deliberate effort to contain, then we anticipate that the numbers of infected cases in these countries will rise even more sharply in the coming days or weeks. And that's why we are quite concerned. The US has just put in place quite stringent border control measures uh, for uh, incoming travellers from Europe. Um, I think they are starting to ramp up some of their measures, and including testing. So we are watching America, and like I said, this is a dynamic situation. Every few days, we get more information about the, sit the status in different countries. So we may put in new countries in the list or we may adjust countries uh, with respect to where they are in these three buckets or three categories which I just described. Um, second question was on, when is the peak in Singapore? <laughs> um, no one, with, we, this is a question I ask our experts all the time. Right? And frankly, no one can give a definitive answer at this stage. If you look at the epidemic curve, or if you look at you know, just data on number of new cases, um, it's quite interesting because you will see a rise in the first, just when the start of, the, of this epidemic, you'll see that it, it rose up. And then that's because of China, it's come down. And then now you, you see another wave of new cases going up, and it's largely cases outside of China. Some of these cases are still at an early stage of the epidemic curve. They are nowhere near the peak that China was before. Right? So, and there are many more countries now. Previously, China, one country, and China took very stringent containment measures to contain the virus within China itself and to limit the spread of the virus outside of China. You are now seeing the next wave of infection around the world. And as I said, the worrying thing is many countries, some of these countries have already given up on containment. And they are quite prepared, as you heard some of um, these countries say, they are quite prepared for the virus to spread to a large proportion of their populations. So if they have given up on containment and they are allowing the virus to just spread, then the number of cases and the next peak that comes may well be higher than what we had faced in the initial wave when the virus was just from one epidemic center. Now we are facing multiple epidemic centers, countries which are not even thinking about containing the virus, and so we may be well facing a much higher um, number of cases outside of Singapore, exposure to more cases. And that's why we are quite concerned that uh, Singapore will indeed be exposed to a new wave of infection which is potentially larger than what we had seen previously. Uh, and if that's the case, we do need more stringent border control measures 
in order to limit the number of imported cases. Even while we continue with our strategies within Singapore, uh, we cannot um, give up or we, we should not get complacent and think that, oh, with tighter border control measures, then we can relax a little bit on what we do sing in, within Singapore. The both have to go hand in hand. We need strong, strict con border measures, but at the same time, as we have been emphasising, we must continue to push forward and do more with our own internal measures. And that includes, number one, being very rigorous with our contact tracing, identification, isolation of patients, ring fencing of infected clusters in order to stem them out as soon as we can. And number two, all the social distancing measures that we have announced, and we may do more as we have highlighted uh, over time, we may consider more stringent social distancing measures uh, if and when necessary. Um, Finally, on uh, your third question, um, what precautions? The task force responsibility is to look at nationwide advisories. Right? So we monitor the situation outside of Singapore. Globally, we look at the situation within Singapore. And we will put out uh, new measures, either on, in terms of border controls, or we will put out new measures in terms of social distancing. That's what we will do. That's our responsibility. Organizers of events, it could be an election event, it could be a private event. Organizers of events will then have to take um, guidance from the advisories that we have put out and reorganize or adjust their event formats in line with the advisories um, in order to ensure that they are safe. So that responsibility lies with event organisers and if it's indeed an election rally or an um, election event, then the relevant organisers will have to take, that, take up that responsibility in line with the advisories that we have put out. Yeah, so event organisers include government agencies. I mean, it, because events are public, there are public sector events too, there are private events. So any event, public or private led, then they will have to take the cue uh, from the advisories that we have put out. Can you confirm that cases 181 and 182 flew in from Indonesia to seek treatment and did they, were they subject to the swap test? I don't have the information at hand. Uh, that's a detail that I think you can ask MOH, they will certainly have it. Um, we, we, like I said, usually we have a full press conference with the MOH officials with all the details at hand, but um, we decided this was important enough not to wait for our regular timings of press conferences, which would be done on a Tuesday, uh, but given the sharp increase in cases overseas, given that this recent days we have already seen quite a number of imported cases. We decided we shouldn't wait any further. And so even though it's a weekend, we decided we would announce it, let everyone know this is coming, and put in place the measures as soon as we can. Um, for the foreigners coming in to seek treatment, could you be a bit more specific about which countries you are more concerned about within ASEAN? I, I think given our, the, the reality is that given the um, proximity, right, and given the convenience of travelling, then anywhere within ASEAN, um, we would be concerned about a surge or a, a sharp rise in demand from people coming to seek treatment, particularly during this critical period. And that's why the health requirement is uh, something that we impose on all ASEAN nationals right? because of the proximity. If you look at the recent cases we've had, um, then yes, they are largely from Indonesia, right? based on the experience we've had so far uh, and, and the ones who have come and then who have been um, symptomatic, tested, positive and are now either in ICU or in hospital. Right. But beyond Indonesia, it could happen, you could have um, 
travellers from anywhere in the region too. And that's why we decided across the whole of ASEAN, uh, we do need not only import control, uh, border controls, um, with this 14 days stay at home requirement or stay at the place of residence requirement, but also this additional requirement for the health information. Oh, I forgot to answer your question. There will be penalties for false declarations, but um, um, we, the, the agencies will be in the best position to uh, ex clarify what, exactly what are the nature of these penalties. Uh, can you, why not use the mic, microphone? Thank you. Uh, expats and foreigners living in ASEAN uh, countries uh, still don't have to submit the health requisite uh, before approving. Uh, That's right. So, th so the requirement now is for ASEAN nationals at this stage. Again, um, all, all our measures are updated, adjusted on a daily basis as we get new information. But for now, it's ASEAN nationals. All right. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You.